How far will a ski jumper fly if she does nothing but only lets the force of gravity do its work? That's the question that we will answer in this video. It will be an excellent exercise on both kinematics and conservation of energy and see how these two can work together to solve such an elaborate exercise. First, some numbers about the system that we're working with. Let's say that the ski jumper starts out at a height of 25 meters and leaves the ramp at a height of 3 meters. The angle of the ramp once it starts curving is 60 degrees, which is also the angle with which the ski jumper leaves the ramp and gets catapulted into the air. Now given only these three pieces of information, we are asked to calculate the distance from the ramp at which point the ski jumper will hit the ground. Initially, it might seem that we simply have too little information to even start solving this problem. However, as we will see, it can indeed be done. And to do so, we first observe that this problem can be separated into two different parts, each addressing a different tool of physics. The first part, on the left, is the region where the ski jumper is sliding down the slope. And because in this region we are not interested in the exact trajectory of the ski jumper, the complete dynamics can be sufficiently described by conservation of energy. Then, once the ski jumper leaves the ramp and gets catapulted into the air, it basically represents an object floating through space with only the force of gravity pulling it down. And this scenario is perfectly described by projectile motion. Therefore, what we are left to do in this part is to use the equations of projectile motion to calculate the distance from the ramp at which the ski jumper will hit the ground. Now, a crucial quantity in these equations of projectile motion is the initial velocity in both the x and the y direction. However, this quantity at this point is still unknown. But it will be exactly this quantity that will be the link between the two different parts of this exercise, the one with conservation of energy and the one with projectile motion. And this defines the strategy for solving this exercise. First, we will apply conservation of energy on the ski jumper sliding down the ramp to find the velocity which she has when she leaves the ramp and gets catapulted into the air. Then in the second part, we will use this velocity as the initial velocity of projectile motion and then use the equations of projectile motion to calculate where exactly she will reach the ground. So let's dive right into that. First, we focus on conservation of energy and apply it to the system of our ski jumper sliding down the ramp. This means that we're looking at the conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy with the constraint that the total energy, which is the sum of both of these terms, remains constant over time. If we consider the height of the ski jumper for a moment, we see that she starts out at 25 meters, then steadily descends to 0 meters, only to go back up to 3 meters. However, energy is a relative quantity, which means that we're only interested in differences. Therefore, it doesn't matter that the slope actually goes down to 0 meters and then back up to 3 meters. The only thing that is relevant here is the difference between the two situations that we're interested in, where she starts and where she leaves the ramp. And the difference in height between those two points is 23 meters. What we will do now is to write down both the potential and kinetic energy for the two points that we're interested in. Point A where she starts out and point B where she leaves the ramp. The potential energy in a gravitational field is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the gravitational constant multiplied by the height h above the ground. In this starting position, the h is exactly 25 meters. The kinetic energy, as you all probably know, is equal to one half times the mass of the object times its velocity squared. However, in this initial position, the ski jumper does not have any velocity and therefore the kinetic energy is zero. Using these two, we can write down the total amount of energy that the ski jumper has at point A, which is in this case just potential energy. Thus the total energy at point A is equal to m times g times h. Now the same can be done at point B, where the ski jumper leaves the ramp. The potential energy in this case is m times g times h prime, where h prime is the height above the ground, and in this case it's 3 meters. 
then the kinetic energy is one half times m times v squared. Now, in this case, she clearly will have a velocity. And it's this velocity, in fact, that will be the initial velocity of our projectile motion later on. And now we can use these two components to write down the total amount of energy at point B, which is equal to m times g times h prime, the potential energy, and one half times m times v squared, the kinetic energy. And at this point, we're all set to actually write down the conservation of energy. We know that the total energy at point A must be equal to the total energy at point B. And because we have expressions for both of these total energies, we can simply write them down. Now clearly we see that we get an equation with the quantity that we wanted, this v, the velocity with which the ski jumper leaves the ramp. We also see that the mass of the ski jumper drops out on both sides of the equality sign. This means that the velocity with which a ski jumper leaves the ramp does not depend on her of his mass. We get that v is equal to the square root of 2 times g times delta h, and delta h is of course the difference in height. Now filling in the numbers, we get that the velocity with which the ski jumper leaves the ramp is equal to 20.78 meters per second. And it will be now this velocity that we take with us to the next stage of the problem, where we will use projectile motion to actually calculate how far she will actually fly. This brings us to the kinematics of projectile motion, which describe the trajectory of the ski jumper once she leaves the ramp. And we will use these equations to calculate the exact distance from the ramp that she will land. Now, for this, we need the initial velocity v, which we got in the previous part, and we need the angle at which she leaves the ramp, which is 60 degrees. And this means that we now have all the quantities that are needed to fill in in the kinematics equations. Now the full equations are the following, which you probably recognize. However, they will be simplified quite a lot by taking into account the specifics of our system. There is an equation in the x direction, which describes the horizontal motion, and there is an equation in the y direction, which describes the vertical motion. Now let's simplify these equations according to the specifics of our system and see which terms drop out. In the x direction, we can consider that x0 is equal to 0 because we can choose the zero point of our axis anywhere we want. We also notice that the acceleration in the x direction is also 0 because there is no force in the horizontal direction. And no force means no acceleration. In the y direction, we note that the acceleration is minus g g because it's the gravitational acceleration due to gravity, and a minus sign because it is pointing downward. We see that in these equations, we have the initial velocity in the x and in the y direction, v0x and v0y. Even though they are not initially given, we can obtain them by taking into account the slope of the ramp, which is 60 degrees. Then we see that the initial velocity in the x and y direction are simply the components of the initial velocity that we found in the previous part, projected in the x and y direction. And of course, y0 is 3 meters, because that's the height above the ground with which the ski jumper leaves the ramp. Now that we have integrated all of the pieces of information into our kinematic equations of projectile motion, we can rephrase the question. Given these conditions, we need to find the range of this projectile motion. Or expressed mathematically, we need to find the specific x for which y of t is equal to zero, because if y of t is equal to zero, that means that we've reached the ground. And for this specific y, we need to find a specific x, and this x will be the solution to our problem. Therefore, we can use the first kinematics equation, which describes the motion in the x direction, to find a specific x. We have that x after a time t is equal to its initial velocity in the x direction, multiplied by this t. This simply describes a uniform motion. However, this equation does not involve a y, so we cannot directly solve our question by finding an x for which y of t is equal to zero. However, this equation does involve a t, a time. So we can rephrase our question again to the following. For which time t is y equal to zero? And then we can fill in this time t into this equation to find our x. And to find this t, 
we will use our second kinematics equation, the one which describes the motion in the y direction. We have that y of t is equal to y0 plus v0y, the velocity in the y direction, times t minus one half times g times t squared. And what we need from this specific equation is a specific time t for which the left hand side is equal to zero. This means that we get a second order equation or a quadratic equation in the variable t. And note that all of the coefficients of this quadratic equation are quantities that we indeed know. For instance, this velocity in the y direction is simply the magnitude of our initial velocity multiplied by the sine of 60 degrees. And v0 is something we calculated in the previous part. Now, of course, we all know how to solve a quadratic equation. We know that we have a plus and a minus solution. The plus solution comes out to be 4.2 seconds. And the minus solution is equal to minus 0.14 seconds. And because we know that in this scenario, negative times don't make any sense, we can readily drop this solution. And we are left with a solution of 4.2 seconds. Now to reiterate, this is the time after the ski jumper leaves the ramp that she will reach the ground again. And of course, to really finish this exercise, we need to fill in this specific time into our first equation again, which tells us what the x position is after a specific time t. And we now have this time t. Filling this in, we get the following. x, which is the distance after which the ski jumper reaches the ground again, is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction, which is the magnitude of our initial velocity multiplied by the cosine of 60 degrees, multiplied by this time t, which is 4.2 seconds. Now, reminding ourselves that this initial velocity that we found in the previous exercise, we find a final distance of 43.6 meters. This means that given the specifics of this ramp, if a ski jumper does nothing but just stand still and lets gravity do its work, they will end up at a distance of 43 meters. Now, I find it quite remarkable how much we can actually calculate from a physical system with only so little information. In this case, only three pieces of information. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more in the future, consider subscribing. And with that, I thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.